title of the message this morning is, uh, It's Going to Be a Hallelujah Morning. And it's Revelation chapter 19 that we're going to be looking at. Revelation chapter 19. First, let me tell you about a teenager who was going to be 16 years old in two months. And so he came to his daddy and he said, Daddy, I'm going to be 16 in two months. In one month, I can get my, my learner's permit. And in two months, I can get my driver's license. And Dad, I'd sure appreciate a brand new, a brand new Mustang convertible for my birthday. That's in two months, Dad, two months. And Dad looked at him and said, well, son, I understand what you'd like to have. Uh, but son, there's some things that you've got to change first you're going to have to do. He said, number one, you're going to have to read your Bible more. Okay, Dad. And you're going to have to bring those grades up. Okay, Dad. And that long hair has got to go. That long hair has got to go. No question. It's got to go. <clears throat> Two weeks passed by. And he, the boy came to his dad again. And he said, hey, Dad, where's my car? He said, well, son, I have to admit you, you have been reading your Bible more. And you did bring your grades up. He says, but you haven't done anything with that hair. He says, well, well, Dad, I've been thinking about that. He said, now, you know, Dad, now, now Jesus had long hair and John the Baptist had long hair. Why can't I have long hair? He and Dad said, well, I'll grant you that perhaps... Jesus and John the Baptist had long hair. We don't know for sure, but perhaps they did. But you also have to remember that they walked everywhere they went. <laughs> you know, some words evoke great feelings. And I'm sure that for that boy, hair evokes some great feelings as well. But words do. And they seem to stir our hearts the minute we hear the word. And I think that's the way it is for many of us when we say the word hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's, it's not a quiet word. It's not something you usually say hallelujah. It's something that you... And if you notice, what are they do? What they're going to do here in, in chapter 19 is they're not going to say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. They are going to shout hallelujah. And they're not going to do it just once. They're going to say hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah. <coughs> and I'm not even getting loud. <laughs> And they were loud. Let's read. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! <clears throat> the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who, seated, who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants! You who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, land like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, has been given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. 
And he added, These are the true words of God. At this, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Do not do it. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider was called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come! Gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gather together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse." And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. On their flesh. It's going to be a hallelujah morning. Notice how it's stuck in between this idea of praise and this idea of hallelujah. First we had the fall of the great prostitute. It was an end. It, it marked the end of, of civilization as we know it. It marked an end of evil in the world. And so we see the, the ending here in the expression of the uh, beast and the false prophet being thrown into the lake of fire. We also saw uh, all of those in the armies who were killed. So it was an end of them. And by the way, all of those in those armies are, are those people who refuse to accept Jesus Christ, who refuse to accept God, who refuse to have the mark of God on them, and instead they had the mark of Satan on them. They had the mark of the beast stamped on their foreheads or on their hands. And so we find <clears throat> that the judgment was against, it was against Rome. And that's really what it was talking about. It refers to Rome as Babylon. And also we have to understand, it's not just Rome, but it's the whole world system. It's gone at this particular point. It's gone. The only things left to be destroyed at this particular point in Revelation is the devil, Satan. He's going to be destroyed next two chapters or so. And... Along with him, death and Hades. And that'll be the end of that. And notice that death and Hades are the last two things to be destroyed. It'll be all gone. So this chapter kind of fits right in here. And it is a praise to God for his judgment on the peoples of this world. The peoples of the world who have shed the blood of his saints. And by the way, 
some people, uh, I don't know where it stemmed from, uh, perhaps the Roman Catholicism, uh, who sanctified certain peoples, and so people got the idea, you don't call me a saint, but listen, if you're a Christian, you're a saint. That's the way God say, looks at it. That's what God says. You are a saint. And that simply means not that you are somebody special all by yourself, but you are somebody special because God says you're special. And God has saved you to be special. And so you're a saint. You're a saint. Now, John turns here to praising God. And in the first six verses... He says, hallelujah, four times. One of these times he says, amen, hallelujah. And then another time he simply says, praise our God. He uses a different word for praise than he does hallelujah. And that, that word for praise uh, simply states Praise only. And God is added. Praise our God. Praise. Hallelujah is a compound word. It's two words stuck together. The hallelujah means praise. Yah means God. It's stuck there, just like it is in some of the names. When you consider names like Elijah or Adonijah, uh, it has special meanings to God and references to God. And of course, Elijah is probably one of the neatest names in the, in the Old Testament because Eli means God and Jah means God. But of course, the idea is, is that one means Lord and one means God. And so he is the Lord our God. That's who he is. And uh, Elijah tells that. The Lord who is God. And so his name is that kind of picture. And so here we have, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, the time of great praise comes just after, as we mentioned, the fall of Babylon, the fall of the great city, the fall of the city that was on the seven hills, the fall of Rome. And we praise God because he has judged them and his judgment, it states here, is just and true. Never any question about God's justice and God's judgments. God doesn't make mistakes. Even when God judges. So if God judges, then we understand. The judgment that's received, is that what it deserves? His justice is true. It's true. And it's right. Always right. So, we praise God for what He's done. It's also praise to God for what He's going to do. Because what's He about to do? He's about to destroy that false prophet. He's about to destroy, excuse me, uh, that beast. He's about to destroy all of those people who refused to accept Him as Lord and Savior. Those who refused to indeed acknowledge God at all who refused to have his name put on them, and who instead over and over said no to God. Plain and simple. And so the judgment is upon them. Now, our focus today is on that word praise. Praise. First, as we mentioned, that's that compound word, and we understand that it simply means praise God. Now understand this. It is also in the imperative. It is a command. It is not a question. It doesn't say, would you please praise God? It says, praise Him. Do it. 
Do it. It doesn't say, will you do it? A command, an order. And if you'll notice who it is that's commanding and who is being commanded. If you look, it's what? The multitude? Three times. It is that group of 24 elders and the four beasts or the four creatures that stand before God. And those four creatures are not to be uh, confused with the beasts that we find that are the evil beasts. But these are the creatures that are good. And it is these people that also cry out, Hallelujah. In fact, it is they cry out, Amen. Hallelujah. Amen simply means, So be it. You're right. You're right. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And that's what they shouted. And now who are they shouting to? Well, they're not shouting to the angels up there. They're not shouting to anyone else. They're shouting to you. They're shouting to me. They're shouting to every person of God, all of God's servants, from the creation of time until he comes again. All God's servants, praise the Lord. Do it. You owe it to God. Praise God. Praise God. Now, <coughs> you have to listen. In verse 6, we mentioned that it simply says, praise our God. And guess what? That's an imperative too. It's another command. Simply using that different word for praise. Ainete. Ainete. Which just means praise. And then it's followed by the word thea. Which is God. Praise God. Now. What all of this amounts to. Is that the multitude in heaven. The 24,000. Or the 24 elders rather. And the four creatures. The four uh, living creatures. That are before God. Are all. And the one voice. That comes from the, ten, from the throne. Are all shouting. Praise God. Praise God. Now. It's a strange thing that people refuse to praise God. People come into a church and sit down and refuse to praise God. They refuse to enjoin in the praise service. They refuse to say, praise the Lord. They refuse to accept him as their God. And that's a sad thing. We're called to praise him. So what else can we do but praise God? You know, our salvation was God's desire. And it says here, praise God because he is the God of our salvation. Yes, it was Jesus who went and died on the cross, but he did that in obedience to the Father. The plan and the idea were all the Father's. They were all God's plans. The plan of salvation is God's plan and no one else's. It's not men's plan. Don't go thinking that you can look through the Bible and discover a plan of salvation that fits you. Because you can't, even though you may try. The plan of salvation is what God says. Not what we say. But what God says. And we need to realize that. And understand that. So... We need to praise the Lord because of what? 
Because He is our salvation. And we need to praise Him because His judgments are true and just. There is nobody like God. We need to praise Him because He indeed condemned the great prostitute and avenged the blood of all of the saints. God is who He is. And because He is who He is, He should be feared. A lot of people don't like that word. Nobody wants to be afraid of God. Everybody says, well, God's a God of love. Why should I be afraid of God? I'm going to tell you something. I grew up in a household and my daddy had a belt. But he used my belt all the time when he spanked me. But I knew something. I always knew that my daddy loved me. And he did everything he could to display that love. But when I displayed a bad temper, when I displayed rebellion, he displayed his anger and his vengeance, usually on my derriere. Yeah. And why should I expect something different from God? Why should I expect something different from God? God is the author of salvation. He loves us so much. But if we completely reject Him, if we completely reject Him, there's nothing left but to be thrown into the lake of fire along with the devil and all of his angels. So, we understand I want to tell you about another little picture that's kind of similar uh, to the picture that we have of God and our praising Him. And the idea of here, they are praising God before He does some of the things He's going to do. Praising Him ahead of time. Now, in 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, Jehoshaphat had heard that the peoples of the east were coming against him. The people from Mount Seir and uh, the people of Edom, Moab, all of those people were coming against him. And they were down on the plain, the people of Midian. And... Uh, when he heard they were going to come, he went to the Lord and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And the Lord said that he would deliver him. So, so when the time came, Jehoshaphat, he gathered up, guess who went to the, at the first of his army, the very front? It wasn't the spearmen. It wasn't the swordsmen. It wasn't the cavalry. It was the singers and the musicians. They went first and they sang and prayed all the way down to the valley and praise God. And when they got down to the valley, everybody was dead and all they had to do was walk around and loot it. Pick up all the goodies because the battle was the Lord's. And here is that same picture. You have a gathering of an army. But you notice who fights? Only Jesus. It's the sword that comes out of his mouth that destroys and not one other person in his army does any fighting. It's all Jesus. And he's going to fight you for you and for your battles. Even your day-to-day -day battles. He'll fight for you. That's the way he is. Now listen, one thing though don't become presumptuous and think that this is one of those name it and claim it things. In other words, I've got the victory and I claim the victory, therefore I've got the victory. Oh, forget that. That's not what it's talking about here. It's talking about the very fact that these people prayed to God. God answered them and they praised God even before he delivered them, because he had already promised to do so. 
And we have to understand that. And this is an individual case, not a generalized case that we understand. So we had, we have the call, we have the call, the call to praise, and we also have the call to the wedding. The call to the wedding. Another reason for praise that's mentioned here is our call to the great wedding feast of the Lamb. The wedding. It's here. And the bride is all ready. She's all dressed in, in linen. In all of her righteousness and all of the wonderful things. And if you notice, it says that, that the linen represents the righteousness of the saints. And it is the righteousness that, that what? That God has given us. Not the righteousness that we've given to ourselves, but what He has given. It says it is the raiment that God gave. And God gives it to us through Jesus Christ and our faith in Him. Not because I'm goody two-shoes, but because I trust God and I put my faith in Him. And because I trust Him and put my faith in Him, I'm going to do what's good and right. I have to put the right things in the right order. And understand this. Who is the bride? The bride is the church. And the church is who? It's all God's servants. All God's servants. Through all the ages. We're the church. We're the bride of Christ. And Christ is coming for us. Now listen. We have to begin again to keep things straight. Our righteousness is what saves us. And our righteousness is what God gives us. And because he gives me righteousness. And he saves me. And he says I am his. I want to do what is right and good in his sight. You get that from Ephesians chapter 2. And that's where it comes from in chapter 2, verse 10. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ to do good works. Jesus gives us the forgiveness of sin. He clothes us with His own righteousness. And He wants us to live like saved people. Plain and simple. We who are in Christ are blessed because we have been invited to the wedding and the wedding feast. And this blessing is the truth of God, he says. And John gives us one last reminder to worship God and God alone. He falls down before this angel and he starts to worship the angel and the angel says, No! You can imagine what he probably jumped back 14 feet, screamed at the top of his voice, and said, No! I'm just another creature like you are. Worship God and God alone. None other. Worship God. There's no such thing as worship of angels amongst Christianity. None at all. There are angels, but we don't worship them. Plain and simple. So John gives us that, that last reminder about worshiping God. Now, what does John uh, see this time? What does he see this time when heaven is opened up? He sees the white horse. He sees the rider on there. Back, all the way back. In the first chapters of Revelation, there was another white horse. And that white horse was the white horse of the first seal. And that white horse went out bent on conquest. And the word bent is the trick word there. It means that it was possessed to do it. Bent. Jesus goes out not bent on conquest. His real bent 
is for salvation. 